The Master of Hell Written by Gordon Philip England Read for you by Edward E. French I could not sleep that night. My body was tired, but my soul was wide awake. My soul was rebellious. It seemed striving to break loose from its imprisoning body, bent upon making some strange tour of discovery, an exploration of the unknown. My physical being shrank from contact with the unnatural. My spiritual being yearned toward it. For some minutes a bitter fight was waged within me, earthly and spiritual lives alike struggling for mastery. My brain burned like molten lava. My heart leapt within me with an awful excitement. The strain imposed upon my senses was terrific. The pain I was enduring unutterable. Suddenly my body weakened. Its powers of resistance diminished. And, seemingly realizing its opportunity, the soul sprang forward, hurled itself with horrible force against the enclosing barrier of flesh, and burst forth. My brain and heart clinging to the spirit passed out along with it. Soul, life and mind alike deserted the earthly dwelling. More swiftly than thought itself, I shot into mid-air and dashed on into unknown space. Cleaving the ether, far out across the universe I sped, leaving behind me stars and moon, sun, earth, and planets, at last I arrived at the very edge of the world, and looking down, saw beneath me a great abyss. Far, far below me hung a vast curtain of smoke clouds concealing from my view the underworld. Spurred on by insatiable curiosity, I flung myself downward through the clouds and, penetrating the thick mass, found myself in hell. Yes, I was in the pit itself. All around me were tall, steep walls stretching upward to meet the ceiling of clouds. The whole area reeked with the smell of brimstone, and underneath me, scorching me with their fetid breath, were huge fires. Gathered around the fires, and feeding them from time to time, was an army of fiery fiends. These were hideously formed their fingers armed with long, poignard pointed red claws, their bodies squat and misshapen, their short legs deformed, their flat feet cloven. These dreadful fiends were many-handed, and in each hand they held souls of the damned. Stretching out their snaky arms, they dangled the souls above the flames, toasting them to a brown crisp while the victims shrieked and screamed in torment. At sight of their awful agony, and at the sound of their piteous cries for mercy, the fiends laughed shrilly, the whole dark pit ringing with their blood-curdling unholy mirth. Suddenly there sounded another laugh, ten thousand times louder than the others, and dwarfing them as a titan overtops a pygmy, shaking the very pit walls with its vibrations. I was almost completely deafened by the hellish laughter, and it was some minutes before I had sufficiently recovered to dare look in the direction from which the sound had come. Even when at last I summoned courage to gaze that way, I could at first see but little, for the whole center of the pit was wrapped in black smoke. Then all at once the wreaths of smoke were dispelled, and my eyes were blasted by the most awful sight an astral body ever witnessed. There, seated on a throne made of living souls of the lost, was Satan himself, and if the sight of the smaller fiends had struck me with terror, then the beholding of the archdemon utterly paralyzed me. Great heavens! What a monster he was! blacker than the pit itself, incalculably larger than any of his followers, most weirdly and grotesquely shaped he was indeed the very incarnation of all that is evil and damnable. 
nor shall I attempt to describe the ruler of the under-regions in minute detail, fearing for the reason of my readers should I do this. But the things that struck me as most terrible about the master of hell were his huge black hands. The long, thick fingers were covered over with large spikes. These tapered to needle-like points and were barbed. Impaled on the barbed thorns were more of the damned, and it had been the sight of his helpless, miserable victims writhing and wriggling beneath his gaze that had caused Satan to roar with laughter. Then, looking a little way beyond the black throne, I saw something else. Running across the pit between throne and wall was a sharp sword. In one side of the pit's floor, below the sword, ran a wide river of liquid fire. Following the swift current with my eye, I saw that after running some distance it suddenly dashed over a precipice into a seething whirlpool. On the other side of the sword, with his immense head turned upward and jaws widely distended, was a dog-shaped thing, which instinctively I knew to be Cerberus, guardian of the pit. In form, Cerberus was not unlike the watchdog of Greek mythology, save that instead of three heads, he possessed only one, and his mouth, instead of being fanged, was lined with two rows of blunt molars. An abnormally long red tongue of living flame hung down from between his black foam-flecked jaws, and his menacing eyes were likewise made of flame. Now, Watching Satan, I saw him place one of those poor damned souls upright upon the razor-edged sword and start it upon its awful journey across the blade. Swaying from side to side, it advanced until it had almost reached the center of the blade. Then, losing its balance, it uttered one hair-raising screech of terror and plunged down into the red stream of liquid fire, which bore it away to the precipice over which it was dashed with stupendous force into the churning whirlpool below. What became of it after that I do not know, for it did not reappear. Then the demon took another victim and sent it out across the blade, but this one walked less confidently than the first shaking from head to foot as it tried to preserve its equilibrium. Nor could it do so long, for its eyes, looking down, fell upon the dog, and it jumped in fright right down in front of the mighty brute. Perhaps you have seen a toad shoot forward its tongue and snap up a fly. In just such manner did Cerberus scoop up the souls that had fallen. Like lightning, the flaming red tongue darted forward, caught the soul upon its tip, and snapped it between those two rows of grinding molars. Crunch, crunch, crunch went the great teeth. Until then, I had, though with extreme difficulty, managed to repress my emotions, but the sight of that wretched damned soul being ground piecemeal in that terrible mill caused me to utter a sudden, horrified scream. Hearing the scream, the whole assembly of fiends looked up as they beheld me, an expression of malignant joy overspread their countenances, and, screeching with mad desire, they rose into the air and clutched at me. Fear lent me additional speed, and, eluding their deadly grasp, I threw myself out of the pit through the clouds into the space beyond. Believing myself safe, now I had escaped the inferno, I slackened speed a little, thinking no demon would dare leave the confines of the pit. Then a red-hot finger touched me from behind, searing and blistering me, and glancing back over my shoulder I saw that a whole company of fiends were pursuing me, and that it had been the foremost one whose fiery claws had just grazed me. Burning with the pain of hell, I dashed madly onward, followed closely by those fiery imps of the underworld. They pressed me close, chasing me here and there through the ether, and I feared each moment would be my last. Then a desperate hope assailed me. If I could reunite soul and body, perhaps I would be safe. These devils had power over the soul, but perhaps this power did not extend to a living flesh-and-blood body. Making a fresh spurt, I commenced my journey back toward my body. The fiends evidently guessed my intentions, for, with louder, more threatening cries, they endeavored to overtake me. 
I was now becoming exceedingly wearied by my exertions, for even an astral body can become fatigued, especially one cumbered with the weight of a heart and brain as mine was, and was almost in despair. I had just come to the conclusion that I was doomed, when all at once I caught sight of my body lying cold and stiff on my bed. Around it were gathered friends and relatives. But the fiends were rapidly cutting down the distance between myself and them. Again I felt a blazing finger touch me, and again I leapt forward in pained agony. Realizing that it was now or never, I put forth every iota of power I possessed, and dashing through the walls, I flung myself against my lifeless form. I felt the cold flesh yield before the impact and let in the soul, and with the last wild yell, the baffled fiends turned tail and fled. A cataleptic fit, that was what the doctors called it. I didn't contradict them, for I knew that to have done so would have been useless. Indeed, a very close friend, to whom I related my story, looked at me pityingly and warned me not to tell it to anyone else, or I would surely be placed in a madhouse. But for weeks... I was cursed with awful nightmares of hideous dreams incessantly. Now they come less frequently, but still at rare intervals. I am afflicted. Every night I go to sleep with the fear of hell fastened in my mind, and expect that ere morning I shall see the master of hell and his frightful dog, that I shall hear that unearthly devilish laughter, and the grinding noise of Cerberus's molars crunching, crunching, crunching. The Master of Hell, written by Gordon Philip England, told to you by Edward E. French. Inquiries regarding this recording should be addressed to email edwardfrench06 at hotmail.com. Be sure to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already done so. The Fiction Fantastic Channel. www.youtube.com forward slash French Edward 06. Good night. Pleasant dreams? <laughs>